that's the data that I was looking at. The red line is the level of private debt. The black line is government debt. Neoclassicals obsess about the black line and ignore the red. When you look at the rate of change of private debt, you can see this plunge here from 15% of GDP in 2006 to minus 5% mm -hmm. in 2010. That's what caused the financial crisis. And because I could see that coming, that's why I warned about the crisis. Do I get taken notice of? Not in, the, not in a, a bloody skerrick. It's all the neoclassicals who had their water prize and Nobel Prize to somebody who didn't see the crisis yeah. coming. Steve Keen, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Welcome. So I, I thought a an interesting place to start would be an experience you actually had traveling to Cuba, because I, I had also been to Cuba back in 2015. Oh, okay. So th this will be relevant later in the conversation, but but Cuba, from what I understand, is heavily rooted in Marxism, is run by the Communist Party. And I wanted to know from your perspective, and we can both talk about what we saw when we were there, what 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 was what was your sure, experience yeah. like? What were the people like, conversations, technology? What what were you seeing when you traveled to Cuba? Well, in fact, what I saw is, uh, I mean, of course, America has drastically affected the country we're maintaining an embargo mm. indefinitely, which, for Christ's sake, give up. The, the event happened 60 years ago. It's about time they normalized relations. So that's obviously one major restriction for Cuba's capacity to uh, be self-sufficient. It can't mm. get any American technology in, and it's got to do all sorts of tricks to evade the various rules that, uh, that America's put on as trading partners about trading with Cuba. That said... Uh, mm. It was, to me, a classic instance of the of the work of the Hungarian economist Janos Kornai. And Kornai tried to explain why socialist countries grew more slowly than capitalist ones. Uh, and he started from a, like a generic starting point. Like if you, if you start from assuming Stalin and purges and stuff like that, then you've got your explanation. It's Stalin and purges. But he wanted to say, well, let's imagine you had a perfect, a really, really good communist uh, uh, government that wanted to therefore wanted to maximise incomes going to workers. Uh, it uh, was op because all these countries began as, you know, far from developed economies, Marx thought capitalism would first fall on the advanced economies, England, France, uh, and um, and America. Of course, he was quite wrong. It happened in Russia and very and, and China, very and, and then also ultimately Cuba, very backward, technologically mm. backward countries. So they had to industrialise, and that meant that, Every last sector needed to be industrialized. They said, if you're putting down a five-year plan, uh, every 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 sector will submit what they need, and then what you'll do is you have to ration what they get because there isn't enough for everybody. So you have what he called a supply-constrained economy, and you also in a supply-constrained economy, you're also giving very high wages to your workers. So they've got uh, you know at least in terms of pieces of paper, technically very large spending power, but you have to queue for everything. And he said, what comes out of that is, first of all, it's, it's pointless to innovate because if you have a, you know, ceaseless demand for motorcycles, then you make last year's model. Uh, there's no, no need to innovate. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and the lack of innovation is what catches you out because in the West, of course, he said the, the West is the opposite. He said Soviet socialist countries is a supply constrained. Capitalist countries are demand constrained. So in a capitalist economy, you've got lots of motorcycle manufacturers. They all um, uh, are competing for the same market. They all have ambitions that exceed their current share in the market. Therefore, there's overcapacity. And if you have overcapacity, the best way to get customers in through your door rather mm. than through your rivals is to innovate. So competition in capitalist economy is via innovation, not by price. Whereas in the socialist economy, there is no competition uh, and you don't innovate. And therefore, you grow more yeah. slowly. And he said that was the fundamental flaw. Now, I saw that in spades in Cuba. And um, there's an old Soviet joke as well from the workers saying, uh, they pretend to pay us because you can't actually spend the money you get on anything. One of my uh, friends in Romania many, many years ago applied for a television set, and she was on a 10-year waiting list to get a television set. So she actually managed to scam a, a, uh, a trip to America and bought one there and brought it back in the luggage. Um, so that, that this ridiculous length of time waiting to get, waiting to get products. Um, but in, and, and therefore what you do is you go to work and you just sit there and do whatever's necessary in the time, but nothing more. So I, um, 
I, I went to, uh, I had one day where meetings were cancelled and I thought I might go to the beach. And there was the tourist unit in the hotel I was in with three women sitting at desks. And I walked into the area and they all managed to avoid making eye contact yeah. with me. I thought I'd stand here, stand here how long to see how long for, and they never did. So I just, I went up, finally asked one of them that I want to go to the beach. I said, I'll get one of the taxis outside. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So what you got was, was, uh, everything was in short supply. Wages were insufficient for buying any real interesting consumer goods. Your health was covered. Your education was excellent. All these things were, were very, very good. And people would always, when talking about their complaints about Cuba, they said, look, health is fantastic and edge systems. But, I, for example, I got driven back to the airport by a taxi driver who was a mechanical engineer. Mm-hmm. And he made more money ferrying tourists from the city to the airport than he could yeah, ever make I, I as an engineer. I haven't met so, many mechanical engineers who have been driving me in Ubers and Lyfts around the uh, around New York yeah, City. Well, they, they usually uh, are making, you know, two to three times what I'm making. And if they're driving Uber, it's just because they missed the conversation and they're like, I, th- I think I need to interact with more people. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it, it was in a country that didn't doesn't innovate. Um, it is actually dependent upon food imports, which I didn't yeah. expect with being in the, in the physical location of Cuba. I thought at least it would be food self-sufficient. So all the various problems of a, of a, of a centrally planned um economy with an absence of innovation were just you know vis- visible to me in Cuba. And of course, what they had to do with anything they had, like cars, for instance, as you know, they couldn't bring in new cars from overseas. They don't have their own car mm. manufacturing industry. So they've got these 30, 40, 50, 60, year, 70 year old cars uh, being maintained and made gaudy, and, mm. and which is quite a colourful side of, side of Cuba. So it was to me, it was uh, the sign of the positives and the negatives of socialism all in one. Uh, the, 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 and inability to break out of the mindset. And frankly, the same thing applies to America at the other extreme, which is why you've got engineers working as Uber drivers in, in, in America as well. But yeah, it was a, it was an ineffective system. And, uh, I think Kornai's analysis far better, is far better than anybody else's analysis of why Soviet socialist economies don't innovate, don't grow properly, and don't provide what their citizens expect. And I yeah. really did see that. Yeah. So. Cuba. In a capitalist country like the United States, when you're up to your eyeballs in hundreds of different variations of the same product, you have to make mm. something better, make it different, innovate, like you said, in order to grow your demand. Mm. Whereas in Cuba, you know, there's a, a state run alcohol, like there's one beer, there's a whiskey, mm. there's one type of car. Mm. You're not really incentivized to make that better because you're essentially getting paid the same thing and they're not going to allow the growth of more products anyway, more variations on the same product. It's just going to stay the same. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, that may be the fate we face in general because capitalism has drastically overstretched the limits of the planet and we will need to be imposing saying you can't make this and there's only be one yeah. version of that, et cetera, et cetera, just to survive the ecological crisis we're rampaging into. Uh, but if you if you look at the you know in the context of a society with and with, without ecological constraints, then a capitalist economy, and as Corn I said, will have booms and crashes, but it will grow more rapidly because of that innovation factor. Whereas the socialist economy will be sort of steady and slow, but won't grow any near as fast. And that's that, that that's the opposite of what the Soviets expected. If you go back and look at the original Soviet five year plans, they were following the guidance of a Soviet engineer called Feldman. And he'd taken Marx's reproduction schema and made it into a proposal for industrializing mm. uh, Russia. And the idea was to build the means of production rather than building consumer goods. But as you built the means of production, you had more capacity over time to produce consumer goods. And you showed this exponential takeoff in consumer goods. And that's what, when, when, when Khrushchev banged the table at the United Nations and said, we will bury you, he actually meant we will bury you in consumer mm. goods because at some point, you know, you'd get this takeoff. Well, it failed for the simple reason that Feldman's equations worked until you ran out of uh, peasant labor you could transfer to the industrial sector. And when you hit that bang, you had to screw at the rate of population. And that was the flaw. Yeah, and it's it's funny that you mentioned seeing people pretend to work in Cuba and, and look busy because mm. I feel like that's definitely infiltrated a lot of the the cubicle you know stereotypical finance accounting jobs in america because i, I was luck i was lucky enough oh, yeah. to avoid that fate 
uh, you know, in the past four or five years or so, but I, I did have that stereotypical cubicle job. And, and one of my friends actually runs a meme account that he started in a in one of those jobs called Work Retire Die. And he just made me <laughs> he just made <laughs> memes about the so, sort of the banality of corporate life and how 80 percent of your day consists of looking busy when people higher up than you walk by your desk pretending to answer emails, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. doing all these things to manipulate an already shitty system into believing that you're doing your job better and working and, and making things take way much uh w way more time than they would actually need because you're incentivized to just be there by the clock like you're punching in nine to five so yeah. why would i do more work than i have to in this span and just like this whole like like the the hysterical dialogue that goes back and forth over email like yeah i'm gonna need to circle back and and follow up on this and just um mm. it, it, when you mentioned that in cuba the, the first thing that popped into my head was like that's definitely a big part of the corporate culture in america too the the aspect of pretending to be yeah busy. and this is like yeah i mean that's david graber's bullshit jobs captured that fairly fairly well and to explain why you get bullshit jobs you have to forget about analyzing in terms of capitalism versus socialism, the best analysis I've seen is by Blair Fix. Somebody else I recommend you get onto the podcast here. And Blair, Blair uh, in trying to analyze it, Blair, Blair Fix, 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 Canadian researcher. Yeah. And, uh, but Blair, in attempting to analyze the data he had on income distribution, both between firms and inside firms in America, a, a tremendous database of salaries and profit rates and so on. And he said the only way he could make sense of it is say your salary depends upon your position in the hierarchy. Mm. And in some ways, that actually gives the people at the top of the hierarchy an encouragement to build something down below them because that's increasing their own status. And uh, Bill Bear's analysis managed to make sense of everything right back to ancient Egypt in terms of hierarchy and income levels. And that's what happens in a large corporation. Uh, there, there's such a level of profitability in a lot of these corporations. Uh, the, the, the markups that they get, uh, the, if, you, if you have a well-functioning manufacturing and business in a capitalist economy, uh, and, and you're the dominant leader, you're the one who done the innovation and get the lead, you have a markup advantage, dramatic markup advantage over your rivals. And you, uh, in, in effect, that markup advantage can be absorbed by the managers, particularly when you've got this crazy idea of managerial capitalism we have these days where owners delegate management to management experts. So, yeah. <laughs> Often what they build is an empire, empire beneath them. And once it starts happening, it's too late. I, I call these people carpet baggers. Yeah. Uh, leading back to the what what happened after the civil war in America, um, so it's a similar sort of thing. There's huge inefficiencies yeah. uh, in a capitalist economy. It isn't just that there's bloated stuff in a socialist one. Uh, the you know, huge inefficiencies, and of course that's partly where you get competitive pressures coming from, because you can see a company as if you're a small company, you see a huge one with that huge overlay, but also huge profitability. That's partly what encourages competition inside industry segments. And it also gives you a chance because you don't have the bloated uh, superstructure until such time as you're you know, up to the same scale as the ones you're uh, attempting to so, bring down. So Blair Fix, he, uh, female, male or female? He, she? Male. So male. he's saying male. that yeah. paying people according to their position in a hierarchy will prevent people from pretending to be busy, essentially. Like, or... No, no, no. Oh, He's saying what, what happens. happens. Okay. That's where it comes from. People are people paid, are paid people according are to their paid hierarchy. According to their rank and okay. hierarchy. And then, therefore, that's an, that's an encouragement to yes. have a hierarchy. And, and so, to prevent that, you would need to de structure the, the hierarchy. And I mean, this is this, he's found patterns in, in the data, and he's managed to get data from all sorts of places, back to the archaeological data as well. The same thing applies under the Egyptians. So it's hardly something the humans have been good at getting rid of. We build hierarchies, and the reason for a hierarchy is that in terms of humans, uh, the maximum number of people we can keep in our minds in terms of a relationship, not just our relationship with them, but their relationship with other people in the 150, uh, is about 150 people. It's called the Dunbar number. And after an anthropologist, mathematical biologist actually, who was studying simian population, the monkeys, uh, in chimpanzees, apes, and so on and so forth. And he realized that there was a relationship between the size of their um, uh, frontal lobes and the size of their community. 
and he then hypothesized, given the size of humans' brain volume, what would be the maximum? He said about 150. Then archaeologists started checking and found most of the primitive societies they had petered out, maximized out at about 150 mm. people. So if you want to go beyond 150, you need to have a hierarchy. Mm. Okay. So in that sense, it's an inevitable part of human organization. We will always have hierarchies. The thing is to stop them. We, we, we have not been successful in stopping them, you know, uh, ending up being a curse as well as a blessing. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely seems like a double-edged sword. And, and I'm thinking mm. just based on my own nature, and I suspect, you know, this, this applies to human nature in general, but if I'm given a position that's higher up than what I currently have right now, I am... I am expected yeah. to do the same amount of work and more and better work than I was doing in the previous position. But then in my own head, I'm thinking, okay, now I need to preserve this spot and this hierarchy so that I don't slip down. So then a lot of my mm -hmm. time, effort, and energy is going into maneuvering how do I not only keep this spot in the hierarchy, but then elevate to that spot so then I can you know, get paid even more. But then the higher I go the more it's like people are gunning for me i'm i'm now mm. almost on the defensive it's like you're you're defending your title as a, a ufc champion where the entire division is coming after you and the higher you get up it, it's hard like it, it's incredibly hard to get to the higher position but it's even harder to maintain that and a lot of your energy has to go into thinking about not only how do i do my job best but how do i keep this position yeah, you know, look, I've always been outside that system, I'm afraid to say. I'm no great fan of hierarchies. I, I find it ridiculous to be you know, promoted yeah. to the top of one. So I was a pretty bad head of school when I was at Kingston University in terms of the effective role I was supposed to fulfill yeah. in that position in the hierarchy. I'm much more of an innovator and a disruptor, so I'm better off on my own. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same way. I'm uh, I'm very bad at doing work that doesn't feel 100% aligned with my purpose and inevitably mm. yeah. working for someone else as I do now in order to support podcasting and have a budget for that. It, it's just, I, I do the work, but there's a, a totally different mindset and a totally different feeling around it. Like I, I'm willing to endure mm. much more suffering in order to put out a good podcast than this, the amount of suffering required to update a, an Excel sheet. Like I, I might lose sleep over podcasts. Mm. I'm not going to lose sleep over finalizing, uh, you know, columns and, and running formulas. And it, it just like, there's no d doing it for someone else. There's, there's, I think it's a good thing to be able to flip that switch and go, okay, maybe this isn't as beneficial mm. to me, but I'm going to do this because it's going to make my company better. But there's a limit to that when yeah. you're not building or experimenting with your own thing. Yeah, definitely. To go back to Cuba for a second. So when you're talking to the the people there, did they seem happy? Did they seem happier than Americans? Did they seem pissed off, malcontent, uh, sad? Like, what was the vibe from the people there? <coughs> Vibe was pretty pretty good, but people would always complain about the physical constraints as well. So, like this, this, and this is the large part of uh, why the Soviet Union, particularly as Germany collapsed as well, because the the mythology was we're going to produce far more goods, and the the life of the working class is going to be better under socialism than it was under capitalism. They certainly had security, and like um, I, I know a lot of people who in the in the ex-Soviet days and. They were you know, delighted to see the wall fall, and then they rue the consequences. Ultimately, the Soviet, the, the Cubans haven't had that transition, but they definitely see the consumer goods they don't get in in Cuba that, that are present elsewhere. Uh, it's it's hard to get stuff. Things break down. You can't get stuff repaired yeah. easily. You have to repair, but it's hard to do it. So that the, all those physical constraints are there all yeah. the time. But they say at the same time they know their health is covered. They know they don't have to worry about. Insurance yeah. for health. Once that my uh, American, my, my alarm is just going off. I'm just going to flip it off real quick. So yeah, so you you were talking about the the people in Cuba and kind of the the discontent with the limit on productions and the the limit on constraints. Yeah, yeah, and and that's generic. Um, you know, it, it's the only way out of it is to drastically modify yeah. the system that the Yugoslavians tried to do. You know, to just to start having you know, 
socialist firms competing with each other, which is what they did in the final days of the Yugoslavian um, system. And I mean, in many ways, that was very successful. A firm called Gorenj uh, came out of that, was quite successful in the international market. Um, so it can happen, but it goes mm. against the grain. And, uh, you know, like I, I, I think uh, it, it's crazy not to realize that every system has some degree of planning. It's just how far did that planning goes and how much do you leave for innovation? And can you include innovation in your planning, which the Soviets clearly mm. failed to do? Uh, it, it's not impossible to imagine you can have, you know, divide the function of innovation and, re, and, uh, and manage manufacturing and have one feeding into the other as independent activities. But that didn't what year? happen. I'm like, like what, my favorite. So what year, yeah, what yeah. year were what you year? in Cuba, by the way? Well, I think about 2016. Okay, so yeah, we were there around the same time. I was there December 2015 yeah. into New Year's 2016. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's great, great social, great social life and good culture. Um, but, uh, and far less, you know, if you want to go and compare it to uh, a, a comparable country, then you look at other countries in South America. Uh, you don't look at America itself because the, the, the industrial development is just hugely different. And people with a similar level, countries with a similar level of, of, of um, physical, um, of, you know, GDP per capita uh, have a far lower standard of living because they have, you know, un- insufficient health, they can be homeless, et cetera, mm. et cetera. So those things don't happen in Cuba. But uh, you, you get, you know, obvious deficiencies in, in, in what's physically available, what you can buy, um, your wage is insufficient. So many people take on second jobs because the, the money is a joke compared to the cost of living. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it is a, stil- a stilted society. The people are happy about the positives and they're, having seen the collapse of the Soviet Union, they're less enthusiastic about breaking it down and going to a yeah. capitalist economy because that was done so disastrously badly. Um, but it definitely shows that a, a you know a pure socialist system, even with with the, you know uh, with the best of intentions, uh, will not be as innovative as a capitalist one. Yeah, I, I had an interesting perspective on innovation. When I was down there because we actually spent a lot of our time on baseball facilities because I went down when I was still playing college baseball at University of Richmond in Virginia. Went down to Cuba for two weeks. Went to eight different provinces. Spent you know, probably 50, 60% of our time on baseball fields, the, the beautiful, like if they're, if Cuba's putting money into something, it's their baseball facilities. Like the, the Cuban, the Cuban, Cuban (laughs) baseball players, we faced, you know, 15, 16 year olds that would outperform your average 19, 20 year old college baseball player. Their level development is is crazy down there. Uh And when you're talking about the, the lack of, innovation in cuba because of that constraint on the the supply the different iterations of products i i feel mm-hmm. like there's in terms of creativity like personal creativity when you are trying to become a better baseball player in a country that mm-hmm. doesn't really have a lot of technology in terms of gloves bats the the fields are they're Great, but they're not like uh, America great where you go down south and go to the college baseball fields there. So by American standards, it's still like pretty crappy yeah. fields, uh, but it was it was some, some of the most beautiful places we were in Cuba. But in terms of a personal creativity standpoint, these players had to be so creative with the lack of materials mm. they had, like people using milk cartons as mm. gloves, uh, just throwing pebbles and using sticks as bats. Uh, there's no really such thing as uh, junior gear down there. there. There's no smaller versions of bats. There's just adult sized bats. Mm-hmm. So you'll see mm-hmm. seven year olds in the street lugging these huge clubs, it, li- literally half the size of their body, because they, they're the only mm-hmm. thing down there is adult wooden baseball bats. So they start to build that strength earlier on. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know what it is, like what with the the lack of materials the lack of technology from an athletic standpoint how they're able to get to the same place as american players and even supersede their skill like cuban cuban cubans mm. are some of the most talented baseball players in the world and a lot of them mm. will risk their lives to escape to america to get mlb contracts they literally have to wait till they travel mm. abroad 
somehow get past the security that's guarding them when they're playing in Mexico or somewhere else in South America. And then, you know, go on a raft or or go get smuggled across the border and sign for thousands, even millions of dollars in some cases. But there's like some, Mm. even though there's not as much uh, technological innovation in Cuba, it seems like that lack of technological innovation forces you to be extremely personally creative with how you're dealing with that if you want to get to the same level as uh countries with far better technology you have to like make up your own shit and acquire yeah. your own skills yeah definitely. Yeah. Mm. um so so i wanted to get into uh economics broadly before we kind of dive deeper into some of the uh specifics of what you've spoken about in, in the the new economics the manifesto which is which is a great read mm. and i should also say before we continue because we haven't mentioned this during the actual recording but the thing that you're holding is a is a covid <laughs> filter you are not in a semi-delusional state where you've taken a, a filter no, and mistaken it for I'm, sure. I'm thinking yeah. like people do people think you think that's a microphone and you're just like holding it to, <laughs> to talk into but no yeah that's actually fresh it just is my little lab uh, yeah. recommended by a nurse in ICU yes. in Florida a couple of years ago, and I've stuck with it ever since. So uh, it means I can wear a mask without wearing a mask, which is right. There you good. go. So yes, that is a, a COVID filter. And before the podcast, we were speaking about possibly putting a, a microphone in there for future podcasts. So you're just like two, two birds, one stone. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that is, that is the reason for that. So y- you've, you've spoken about how you don't consider economics a science. And I wanted to ask you at a, a broad level, what makes economics fundamentally different from sciences like biology or, or chemistry, for example? I think the fact that it has an ideology built into it. Um, so if you look at the development of economics over time, I think it actually went astray right from Adam Smith. In my analysis, uh, Adam Smith um, sidelined the development that we were going through and trying to understand uh, how human civilization came about. Um, and what we got involved in said was a war over who produces what, who's responsible for the for the wealth that we have. And so you had a, a, you know Marx coming out and finally saying workers are responsible for the wealth and capitalists are exploiting workers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you then got the neoclassical school developing, saying, no, it's a cooperative adventure in effect. Workers workers work to get a, a, a wage reflecting their marginal product. Capitalists do the same. Uh, the two together produce output, and uh, and it's distributed on the basis of merit. And what you get out of that uh, in, in the neoclassical theory is basically a vision of, a, of a, an anarchist utopia. Mm. Because the whole idea of the neoclassical theory is you, 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 you just draw your supply and demand curves, that is totally independent of the existence of the government. Mm. Okay. So, so, uh, and if any, any government, the only way you can show government intervention on that supply and demand curve thing is moving away from the equilibrium, which of course is not good. Okay. So the opening framework is a non-government system. So how can you function with a non-government system? Well, you need a system which is absolutely meritocratic. And that's the idea. You, your workers get their marginal product. Capitalists get their marginal product as well. Everybody's being paid in accordance with the contribution. And that becomes a very strong ideological um, defense of a capitalist economy. Now, it's completely wrong. Okay, It's completely wrong as a model about how people get income. But what it says is fundamentally that a, a pure market economy with no government intervention, no concentration of power, no unions will still function because the market will coordinate everything and people will uh, the market will both let people produce what they're good at and let them consume what they want. Uh, sub- subject to the physical resources of the of the economy, so it, does, it actually becomes a vision of a perfect society. Now, as it happens, that perfect society is described by a set of rules in mathematics. So you have a, a theory when you, when you, when the neo, this with the, the neoclassical did not the Austrian but the neoclassical who followed this school of thought. So they have a, a model of your consumption which is based on a, a concept of mini, diminishing marginal utility that has mathematical rules attached to it. You then have a theory of supply. Uh, which also have mathematical rules attached to it. Now, every time that economists or mathematicians have gone in and tried to examine those rules and say, do they actually reach the outcome, the theory says, the answer has been no. Mm -hmm. So one of the very first ones uh, 
Val, Val Ra, who built the first uh, attempt at a mathematical, large-scale mathematical model of the economy, had this idea of multiple consumers also being producers coming to a big market and they have a whole bunch of things they have. They own, they want to sell, and other they want to buy, depending upon what the relative prices are. And so there's this huge auction, uh, and it isn't just like auctioning one thing. It's auctioning dozens, hundreds of different products all at once. And you start off with a random set of prices because uh, you, know, you might use yesterday's prices as the today's, but you have a random set of prices fundamentally. And then there's a, a, a person that was called the Volrosian auctioneer whose job it was to say, well, where demand exceeds supply, the price has to rise, and where supply exceeds demand, the price has to fall. And you make all those adjustments, and ultimately you'll converge to an equilibrium mm-hmm. set of prices where the market in ev- every market is in equilibrium. Then and only then, an environment system is trade allowed to occur. So that process has to necessarily converge to equilibrium or nothing will happen in the model. And Volra, uh, logically, um, has tried to work out, well, if you, if you look at all the, 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 the diagonals, so you have each, each market's going to have demand for itself as, as part of its overall pattern. So you're doing a huge table of numbers and the diagonal will be the ones where you, the, where you, you adjust the price and you affect the price in that market itself rather than some other market. He said all the changes along there go in the direction of equilibrium, whereas all the ones on the other side, off the diagonal, uh, some go towards, some go to, against. So therefore, he thought overall it would converge mm-hmm. to equilibrium. And he took that idea to the leading mathematician of the time, a guy called Henri Poincaré, who's one of, if you wanted to have the top 10 mathematicians of all time, Poincaré's in the top 10. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, and he, I just wanted to to recap just so I yeah. I make sure I, I understand. So, neoclassical economists assume that the the free market is applying these pressures that are constantly keeping us at equilibrium, and yeah, that's right. The yeah. they they have these mathematical formulations that don't actually uh, conclude that. Like it it doesn't. It doesn't portray yeah. the realistic state yeah. of the economy, but in terms of what their ideal is, their ideology, we are at a state of equilibrium most of the time, and then there's fluctuations within yeah. that. So there's and and mathematically, yeah. So the the point is that that, that mathematical pro you can actually set it up as a set of equations in, in ve- vector mathematics, matrix mathematics, and it depends upon. It, 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 that process that Valra well, thought would converge to equilibrium was accidentally shown not to by mathematicians solving a problem in pure mathematics in the early 1900s. I call the Poincaré and Frobenius were the two mathematicians. So it meant you don't get equilibrium prices, even if you could get the auctioneer to do what Valra thought the auctioneer did. It wouldn't mm-hmm. converge to equilibrium. Now, what that means is the sensible interpretation, oh, well, prices must be out of equilibrium. But that's okay, because that can explain creativity and capitalism yeah. too. You know? But instead, oh, no, we can't do that. So they fudge the result. Mm. They literally, I mean, the, 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 they, they called it the dual stability problem, and they then ignored it. Um, so that didn't work. They thought they could derive a demand curve from, from individual demand curves, which is what you get taught in the textbooks. That doesn't work. That's what's called the sonnenschein mantel de uh, con- uh theorem. Uh, so all this stuff didn't work. Now, rather than saying, oh, dear, well, maybe things are more complex than we expect. We're out of equilibrium uh, demand. We have to take into account income distribution, which we don't now models to explain demand, et cetera, et cetera. Rather than doing that, they continued functioning. Now, what that meant is a practice of avoiding the direct consequences of logic and empirical data became embedded in economics. And the, well, my favorite example of this actually involves Alan Blinder, who's, thank God, hasn't got a Nobel Prize mm. yet. Uh, but uh, was the uh, he's deputy governor of the of the, uh, the the Federal Reserve. He was deputy president of the American Economic Association. He did a survey into the cost structure of firms and found that about ninety percent of firms that rather, rather than having rising marginal costs, which is what all the textbooks teach, they had constant or falling marginal costs. And he actually described that in the book called Asking About Prices as overwhelmingly bad news. Brackets for economic theory. Mm. Now, he found that economic theory is wrong, in other words. Now, did he change his textbook? Yes, he did. He didn't even acknowledge his own research in his textbook and continued teaching rising marginal So this guy, now, that this is guy religious. solved his own... That is religious. That yeah, is not this guy scientific. solved his own problem. Yeah. 
and then rather than update by ignoring his own research. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to like I'm trying to. Th- that's not a science. That's not a science. That's a religion. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm just trying to think what about human nature would cause someone to do that and religion. I mean, w- when you believe something, when when the belief itself becomes more important than the reality that you're seeing in front of you you can jump through all sorts of hoops to justify what it and, is. And this, this is something which, yeah, it, it is something which is about how humanity functions, okay? Um, and and I think we, we, said we tend to regard scientists as one extreme and, and, and repress at the other. But in fact, I think they're on exactly the same dimension. Uh, they're very, very close to each other. Um, but the difference is then is science. You will believe something, then you'll try to do an experiment to check whether it works or not, and you, the experiment fails. Mm-hmm. And then you go through a real personal dilemma, and you've ultimately got a. a you, most people can't can't handle that. So the best example of that is actually Max Planck, the guy who discovered quantum mechanics. And the way he discovered it was there was a, a Maxwell's theories of electromagnetism, which were an incredible uh, you know, achievement in human intellect, without a doubt. But those equations couldn't claim it's called black body radiation. So every, everything around us is emitting black body radiation because uh, you know you take in energy, you, you transmit it back out again. So there's a there's a spectrum of energy coming out of uh, any yeah. any object. The, uh, the, and, I, and I just wanted the, to, the, I, the I'm sorry to cut you off. I just, I just wanted to yeah. say the uh, the way that you describe the different schools of thought and economics in in yeah. the the new economics manifesto, also debunking economics. It does sound like mm-hmm. a bunch of different religions where the leaders of schools yeah. of thought are acquiring followers based on faith and not followers based on evidence where you have like an economist yeah. at the pulpit shouting, you know, this is what I believe and I'm trying to get these followers and their schools of thought are passed down at universities. And then when those students get old enough, they start to teach and it, there are you're right. There are a lot of parallels in that respect, from what I understand, with my with my unexpert insights to my religious upbringing in the Catholic Church and going to Catholic school. It, it does seem yeah. like it's in that vein of if you have a problem with what I'm teaching, it's because your faith isn't strong enough. That was that was always the answer. It, it was yeah. there was two things. If you ask a question in class about religion, and you just didn't get something that there was there there was something off about a story or just a just like going to confession to getting your sins wiped clean and saying 10 hail marys 10 hour <clears throat> fathers why is that a thing what why is there no sort yeah. of uh th- th- there's a lack of accountability for what you've done other than saying your your penance to god and and when you question that it's either it, it typically uh tends to be one of two things it's your faith isn't strong enough or God works in mysterious ways and humans aren't, and humans aren't (laughs) meant to understand it. And there, there are really good. uh, I had great teachers who were brothers and priests. So I don't want to throw all of them under the bus. There were, there were some influential, uh, you know, really intelligent and and insightful professors I had in in high school, but the majority of what we learned was that faith is the most important thing. And, evidence yeah. should be in support of that faith and when it's not go to your faith not the evidence yeah and that's and that's, so the, the only reason science breaks away from that is you have anomalies that develop because the faith is wrong like you know the faith for example that the earth is the center of the universe was the fundamental mm-hmm. Ptolemaic astronomy and they then built a set of models and then mathematical arithmetic models of the universe which were quite accurate at predicting where the planets would be you know, a couple of hundred years in advance. But the calendar kept on changing, all sorts of things started going wrong. And then along comes a, a disruptor, Galileo, Copernicus, uh, Tycho, Bray, etc., etc. And they said, look, we can't make sense of these observations except by assuming the sun is the centre, not the earth. And then you get, uh, and, and then so you, you have a, the, the, when it comes along, um, once, once like, you know, Galileo shows that there are craters on the moon, then the faith that the, this again very much the Catholic faith of the time, the faith that the universe is perfection and all decay happens on Earth, no longer makes sense when there are obvious craters on the moon. Mm. 
and there are moons circling other planets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all this stuff becomes a, a cognitive dissonance problem. And what Planck said when he did the same thing with quantum mechanics is he didn't convert a single one of his Maxwellian friends to accepting his quantum mechanical interpretation, which made sense of the data. But what happened was any student could then go and, and could go and test that for themselves and find that Planck was right and what they were being taught that professors was wrong. So the professors could go blue in the face trying to maintain the, the Ptolemaic system at one stage or the um, uh, Maxwellian at the other. The students would just listen politely, but note that there's an anomaly that these guys can't accept. They, they can't change their faith enough. And ultimately, they have to retire or they die. They get replaced by new students. And you say, right, now I can work on what I believe. Mm. And you get a new belief taking over. Economics doesn't do that. Instead, the, the type of things which disturb the paradigm in economics, for example, the financial crisis in 2008, that's gone. People have forgotten about it. Mm. Okay. So... They get bloody Bernanke of the Nobel Prize, and he, did, he had no damn idea what was going on at the time. So we forget we don't get that change, we don't get the generational change, and therefore economics remains a belief system rather than becoming So science. when there is that disturbance in the paradigm, like the financial crisis, Great Depression, what's the mechanism in economics that keeps those debunked theories going in the way that it doesn't happen in science? Like once someone point something out in science the followers will i mean you'll probably still have some followers in the short term but then over time when people are running experiments the you know if you don't believe in gravity that's going to cause you a lot of problems when you uh try to yeah. run an experiment property but what what is that thing in the the economics community that keeps it almost like a gene being passed down Oh, it keeps on. Uh, the crisis gets forgotten, or the crisis changes nature. So you have a approaching financial crisis. People like myself warn it's coming. Uh, nobody takes notice of it within the profession mm. that you get ridiculed. Then it happens, okay? And in the aftermath, how the hell we didn't see this coming? What can we do about it? And they end up saying, well, there's no way really about to think about it, except from how we did in the past. And we simply make the need to make more models more complicated. Mm. So Olivia Blanchard is my favorite example there. Blanchard, literally in August of 2008, so a year after the crisis began, uh, had published a paper saying the state of macro is good. He was editor of the yeah. American Economic Review Macro. He thought it was a good state. But then he said, what do we do? He admitted all sorts of things went wrong. But he finally said, oh, we simply have to start from a, a model of a competitive economy and build up. How else can we do economics? Yeah, going... And like that's that's the sort of the toll make thing. How else can we model unless we assume the Earth is stationary? Yeah, going going back to memes, that reminds me of the meme where there's a student sitting in class and the classroom is burning down all around them, and the caption is "Everything's fine," like mm. everything's fine, everything's fine. Yeah, as the world's yeah. just slowly going to shit. Yeah, and there's no consequences for them either. This is the other thing. If engineers built bridges the way economists build models of the economy. Economic would change damn fast because so many people would be but engineering would change because people would be dying if going on bridges and yeah. collapse. Um, but the economists aren't necessary. The economy functions quite well if the economists didn't even exist. So, and and therefore they can get away with nonsense theories and and, and remain insulated from the states. So when you when you present a theory like you have with new economics. Have you has anyone tried to burn you at the stake? Like when you go against other religions, or even in science, people will come at you in ways like you're committing a heresy because because you are you're, you're going against oh, yeah. the god of yeah, that yeah. religion. Has, has anyone yeah. tried to you know tie you down and stone you or you know flog you on social media? Like what oh, what's the you, reaction you, you get? Oh, pretty negative. If you look at like a red, there's a Reddit to get dedicated to me, I think, by neoclassicals, and um, there's a what they call jo jobs for economists. I get slandered there quite regularly. So yeah, it definitely happens. Um, they ridicule yeah. you, okay, and that's just the common situation of somebody who's outside the mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm lucky that I'm nowhere near the place where I have thousands of people on Reddit talking about the you know. Uh, the state of uh, podcast or, or just like trashing me in general. I, I've, I, you see it in the podcasting world too, where it, it's not because someone's presenting a new theory, but just because people dislike someone, it, thousands of people will gather in the same place. And it usually turns into a dumpster fire pretty quickly. And I've even gone on to mm. 
the reddits of shows that I like. And then 10 minutes later, mm. I'm like, do I like this show? Like, I, I think this entire show is bullshit. The host is doing this. The host is doing that. And then I have to snap myself out of it and remind myself that I'm just in this vortex of hatred right now. And then you'll get the occasional person who comments mm. on Reddit. Hey, guys, uh, we're all fans of the show. Why are we just on here to to trash this person? And then ultimately that person gets trashed. So I imagine reading a Reddit about yourself is the quickest way to hate self-hatred and, and having to to snap yourself out of that, I imagine, can be pretty hard. Oh, yeah. I just don't. You know, if I wasn't wasn't annoying them, I wouldn't be doing my job properly. There you go. I mean, if, if you're not a. Uh, you got to piss someone off on on one side. If, if you're not pissing off anyone, then hmm. it's uh, yeah. Trouble is, we don't get listened no. to. I mean, like like for example, seeing Bernanke get the Nobel Prize. I mean, what a joke! Um, because like the whole base of the Nobel Prize was the belief that uh, banks are intermediaries, and that's what they got the bloody prize for. And in 2014, after the crisis, the Bank of England came out and said banks create money. They're not. They're not. They're not. Uh, uh, reallocators, they're not intermediary, they create mm. money. Uh, and the same thing with the Bundesbank. And they still give a Nobel Prize to a guy who doesn't even refer to that literature mm. um, in his own Nobel papers and Nobel Prize speeches. So, yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't take them seriously. And I think it would be a damn sight better off if there were no economists at all. Is, is there, do you have any beneficial dialogue with neoclassical economists are, are there any no. that reach out to you and say hey i can no. kind of see your ideas or oh well, like the, there's, like, there's, there's one neoclassical economist that I've, I've, I've worked with uh, michael kumoff who works with the bank of england and michael is about the only neoclassical understands that banks create money so he builds the you know, standard neoclassical models with money creation in them it gets very very different results to the to the others now he's copying the sort of abuse that i mm -hmm. copped uh, from the neoclassicals for doing that inside their own framework. So I do have some, and I, you know, I think I've got quite a few you know, people. Are people are people, even if they believe a different religion to you. So I've got a, a, quite a number of friends who are neoclassical economists and yeah. decent relationships there. But in terms of in terms of actually influencing, like you simply can't say, look, you've got the wrong. Uh, so just making a small change to your paradigm, rather than assuming the Earth is the center of the universe, why don't you assume the Sun is? That's not a small yeah. change. It's incommensurable. You give up one, you've got to completely abandon everything else you've done. Um, so it isn't possible in that sense to have a, a meaningful dialogue across different paradigms. You've got to say which one fits reality better, and that's one we should adopt, and it certainly isn't the neoclassical paradigm. But they'll stick with it because it's the reinforcement it gives them, this ideological vision they often don't even know they have. Uh, is an essential part of why they find the theory so up Do you have neoclassicals DMing you saying, hey, I like what you're doing, but if I come out and adopt this theory, I'm going to lose my job and all my textbook sales and, and things like that. Just people behind the scenes being like, good job. I can't do this. But there, there, not, not really. But what, what there is is like, if you look at the entire population of economists, like academic economists, um, a substantial proportion, but not about the order of one, one in 10, are critics, but they often don't have the courage to come out and say mm. so. So I get a lot of support from people like that. Uh, there was a French attempt to build an alternative economics system, and the French is very tops down. They have you actually get allocated to a university. You're classified as an economist once you get your PhD, and then you're allocated. Mm. And there are 1,800 economists. Now, when they talked about forming an alternative group, 300 of the 1,800s that they wanted to join up. That's one in six. I don't think it's quite that large across the rest of the planet, but that gives you an idea of how many economists are dissatisfied but still teach what they teach because they teach what they teach. Well, yeah, one, I mean, one in six is a pretty big chunk, especially. I think it's more like about one in yeah. ten. Like a, the the post-Keynesian economists like myself, uh, Louis Philippe Rochon, Mark Lavoie, um, the MMT mob, uh, we all end up working at minor university. We can't get jobs at the major university. We still exist. So you get this substrate of people normally at the lower rank universities or colleges in America and so on, uh, that, that's where the non-Orthodox stuff continues to live. Uh, and a, my, a handful do switch from post-Keynesian, from neoclassical to post-Keynesian or Marxist mm. or Austrian. So they always end up turning up, but they're always the minority, and they get disparaged and treated very badly by the So majority. let's say you had an interview for a professorship at an Ivy League school in America, and they didn't read your work, but they 
knew that you were a good professor and you're, you're going on the interview and, and you say that you're not a neoclassical economist and you actually have an alternative theory and, and you, you want to flip the whole thing upside down, what would be the response of someone who's in charge of hiring at an Ivy League university, like the dean or whoever it is? There'd be lots of squirming and I'd be asked to leave the room. Ultimately. Really? You don't get a job. You don't even get a look in. That sucks. So, um, you know, the, yeah, I mean, it totally sucks. Cambridge University, UK, for example, what used to be a bastion of non-Orthodox thinking back in the days of Joan Robinson, Nikki Caldor, and so on. Um, over time, the neoclassicals just targeted Cambridge as a place to get into and dominate. Now it's absolutely rampant neoclassical. Mm. Uh, the only people who are non-neoclassical in Cambridge, people like uh, Hajun Chan and Tony Lawson, work in other units within the university. They're not part of the economics department, strictly speaking. Um, so, yeah, they just drive out uh, alternatives and you, you get treated as a heretic. Yeah, uh, it, it makes me think about, uh, I forget which Harry Potter movie it is, but there's a, a scene where there's this, you know, after class learning of the the dark arts some spells that the mainstream students aren't learning i guess it's for especially gifted wizards and i'm wondering if there are you know uh quote unquote neoclassical economists that think more in line with how you think that are teaching these secret meetings after school you know in these rooms where you can't get a wi-fi connection they're going underground like you would be questioned like the cia and they're teaching and the new economics theories well the, the student this the students themselves have started that so you got the rethinking economic movement post crash mm. uh the autistic economic movement etc cetera, etc cetera. so student movements form mm. and what's happening now which is different to in my my view is that uh they often get supported funding um, so from things like the People for a New Economy, the Soros Foundation, et cetera, et cetera, INET, and they continue meeting, continue looking at alternatives. Because the, the, the neoclassical stuff, it really is like being taught Ptolemaic astronomy when you're seeing rockets landing, uh, you know, and in the neighboring neighboring town. Uh, it, mm. It's totally out of whack mm. with reality. And and that, that huge gap between the, the cognitive dissonance for a student coming in if they're capable of thinking outside of, a, of the, what they're being taught, then the cognitive dissonance is huge mm -hmm. and they form student societies. So I talk to student societies all over the planet. Uh, but what happens is the, um, the professors continue teaching the neoclassical stuff and the students go off and they might find a tutor who's favorable. So, for example, Devrim Yilnaz is one of the first people I hired at Kingston University. Devrim was teaching at Manchester University. He was non-orthodox, a brilliant mathematician, mathematically, so he got his PhD building a standard neoclassical model. But students asked him if they'd he'd teach a non-orthodox course. Within a year, his contract was terminated. Wow. Even though he was also teaching neoclassical, they said yeah. you can't, in addition, yeah. teach another class that students are interested yeah. in. Yeah. Like I know, I've, I've read different mathematics. It's really good yeah. at mathematical systems. Uh, both uh, ne neoclassical DSG stuff, he can build that in his sleep. And he builds enormous nonlinear differential equation models of developing economies now oh. for a living. Uh, so he's truly capable of the mathematics. No way you can put him down on the mathematical front. But within a year of starting a course at the request of the students, his position, which had rolled over for many, many years, was terminated, which is why I'd hired him mm. in Kingston. So there's a, there's a purge of, uh, of particularly of, uh, of critics who are mathematically mm. capable. So the plan from an economist of your perspective is to gather other economists who think like you or, or may be willing to uh, be open to an alternative economic theory and then rather than try to change the system that's existing that, that's too rotten already, you have to just create something entirely yeah. separate. Can't do it. I, I want to legitimize non non economics departments teaching economics because they've got a monopoly, and that's bad, of course. According to their own theory, monopoly mm -hmm. is bad. Well, they've got a monopoly in teaching economics. They enforce it rigorously at the universities. They shouldn't be able to get away with it anymore. So if engineers want to put in a course in economics, go right ahead. Biology, history, et cetera, et cetera. And like I'm a great fan of system dynamics, which is a, a generic way of thinking about dynamic systems. We should be using that mm. rather than economics. So I'm encouraging anybody that they want to do a PhD in economics mm. or even a degree in economics, don't bother. Uh, do a degree in system dynamics mm. as well. Learn a useful skill, 
which you can apply in all sorts of industrial uh, settings and, and work settings, and then you know in your own time apply it to mm-hmm. economics when you want to. But for Christ's sake, don't lend a straight yeah. economics degree. So I, I wanted to to take a step back a little bit, and and we'll just hop all over in terms of the range of time. But but you've said that physiocrats mm-hmm. are the most interesting school of economics. So I, w- I wanted to ask you mm-hmm. what. Do physiocrats believe, and what makes them the the most interesting? Well, they arose, of course, in France, and that even they have got quite, quite a number of Irish people actually turned up as major thinkers in the physiocratic school. And what they looked at, they, they you look at an agricultural system. You plant a seed, you you come you come back three months later, you've got a plant. Okay, go from a seed to a plant with seeds, and that uh, emphasised to them that. The wealth actually came from what they call the pure gift of nature. So it isn't anything you do. The plant will grow. Okay, it might get eaten by by birds or insects, but it will grow regardless of what you do as a as they call the husbandman. Their their idea for the person actually doing the farming. But they said all wealth comes from the land, and then manufacturing changed that wealth into a different form. But they couldn't see any parallel between agriculture and manufacturing. They call that culture the productive sector and manufacturing the sterile mm. sector. Now, what they were right about is that the only reason we have a society in the first place, the only reason we have life on the planet, is because we're getting a free flow of energy from the sun. Nobody built the sun. Okay. Mm. But the sun generated the energy we get from that enabled life to evolve and then enabled us to evolve and then enables us to build an industrial civilization. And so it's, that's the, the, we are basically mining nature. So if you look at the laws of thermodynamics, we know you can neither create nor destroy energy, energy matter. Uh, you simply change its form. And that means there's no such thing as a surplus. Mm. Okay. Now, that is different to what Marx came out with saying later, and it's different to what the neoclassicals said. So they, in a sense of being correct about the thermodynamics of how we manage to survive both as burst life forms on this planet, but also industrial civilization, on this planet, the physiocrats were right that you've got to say it all comes out of us exploiting the pure gift of nature, and then we distribute the bounty from that through our social relations in a capitalist or a feudal economy. And um, this was in the seventeenth so seventeenth century, sixteen hundreds and seventeen hundreds. Wow! So yeah. th- this this school of thought, the physiocrats, were able to recognize the the gift of nature. As you said, that if we yeah. are whatever we're building, manufacturing, innovating, that that comes from the resources on the planet, and those deserve to be respected yeah. and well, if there's, 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 Yeah, there's, yeah. It, 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 for a start, you instantly say, "Well, the environment is critical. You can't have an economy without an environment." Now, what do neoclassicals do? They have production being based on labor and capital. Mm. Okay leaving out the environment completely, and they've become totally devoid, and this is why they reckon climate change is so bad. They have no damn idea of the dependence of the economy upon the environment. But you start from the environment. You, you, that's absolutely necessarily included. And then what you get is, um, you know, the, the, it would, be, would have been possible to combine the physiocratic line with thermodynamics when that started being developed about 100 years later, and we would have had a, 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 a physically valid foundation for our theory of economics. Instead, we've got the neoclassical stuff, which is like aping physics in one sense, but not understanding it. And so, um, and then Adam Smith led us astray by saying it's not land at the source of all value, it's labor. And we got involved in what I call the value wars between neoclassicals and, and, uh, and classical economists. And that, when Marx came out and used the classical school as a way of you know, critiquing capitalism, saying it should be overthrown, that's when the neoclassicals took over. So the, the only decent foundation was what the physiocrats gave us a quarter of a millennium ago, and I'm trying to get back to it. Yeah, so it, it's crazy that they were able to to recognize the the power of the earth and and the the preserving of resources mm. all the way back then, and then the so so Adam Smith equating the value to just labor that is what led us away yeah. from the physiocrats. Yeah. There, there was no sort of a uh, strong economic theory that aligned with the physiocrats that could take on Adam Smith. Like it, it was just once Adam Smith came along, that became the predominant form of thinking. Or how how did that happen? Well, they also, I mean, the, 
the physiocrats were also heavily involved in French politics. And that's not good for your health. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think any politics so is. <laughs> ended up, you know, no. So a few of them died in a, yeah. you know, mysterious circumstances, and the school of thought died out. And of course, France wasn't the dominant economy. Uh, if you think of the dominant economy, with the was was not just England, but Scotland as well, because that's where the Industrial Revolution began. With James Watt's steam engine. So in that sense, this, the intellectual centre of thought mm. shifted to Scotland, particularly with Smith. And then we lost what the physiocrats had done. And they were disparaged and you know, ridiculed in various ways. And there were the elements about their theories which were strange as well. But by starting from saying that land is the source of all... Uh, well, actually, they said land, what they meant, what they called the pure gift of nature. Literally, it's a quote from Turgo. And if anybody wants to see what I'm talking about, I recommend reading Turgo's on economic... T-U-R-G-O-T, Turgo on economic theory. And, um, and, and that insight was lost. Now, that was the right foundation physically to start from. And Smith led us completely astray, and you got all sorts of conundrums. So with the physiocratic idea, uh, the price system simply allocated the surplus between what you, what you got for free from nature and the cost of you getting that gift from nature. And therefore, you then had the, the husbandman, as they, the proprietor, uh, had all that gap between what they got for free and what they had to pay to get what they got for free. And that was a source of wealth for them, and they could use it to buy the labors of others and so on. So it was a very different theory of distribution of income as well. And that would have been the right foundation for economics, but we lost it courtesy of Smith. So if, if Adam Smith never came along and the physiocrats enjoyed, enjoyed a, a stronger lineage of thought and practice mm -hmm. all the way up till 2022... How do you think the world will, would look differently if we were still functioning on the value comes from the land where we're respecting the free gift of yeah, nature? Well, first of all, they would have realized that the, the industry uses the same pure gift of nature, which is fossil fuel. That's just old mm -hmm. sun. You know? So in that sense, it would have been generalized and said it's not just labor, not just the agriculture, it's also industry. But industry is powered by fossil fuels. So therefore, it's still a, free, a pure gift of nature that enables it to have an advanced civilization. And when the laws of thermodynamics came along, it would have made eminent sense to combine the two. There would have been a compatibility between economics and physics at that point, this is for the 1870s. And what you would have had as the theory said, well, if there's, we're going to have production, we also have to have waste. Because the second law of thermodynamics, mm -hmm. the law that in disorder, en entropy increases over time, uh, that would have been part of it. So we know we're generating waste. Okay. Now waste we're generating on a biosphere. Okay. So you would have had an ecological economics developing in the 1870s. Mm. And then, if you mentioned the sophistication we would have got after that as well, we would have realized in the 1920s or 30s that we have a system which can't be sustained indefinitely. And that would be a century ahead of where we are now. And I think without that, we might well be able to maintain a capitalist economy, whereas I think what we're going to go through, courtesy of neoclassicals, will be a collapse of capitalism. Yeah, so the, the, the late 1800s industrial boom would you think that would have not been as strong with the different types of technology being offered? Well, no, it would have been possibly even possibly even stronger. Oh wow! Okay? But there would have been a realization, look, mm -hmm. you know, because we a whole lot of stuff which which physics has been saying for centuries, which even has been ignoring, would have been able for economists would have been able to understand it. But like when when physicists talk about the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, and the entropy. Oh, yeah, well, that makes sense. That, that, that necessarily, there's, that means that we have to have more waste generation. Like, you know, with you two, you're talking in a closed system, uh, partially. So you've got new energy coming in, that means you don't have that disorder occurring in the closed system. But in the aggregate, you must still yeah. be obeying the second law. That form means we, we, to generate production, we must be generating waste. If we're generating waste, we're damaging our productive capability. That would have been a, an awareness of a, you know, undermining circularity in production uh, right from the 1800s. Now, instead, you get bloody uh, William Nordhaus coming along in the 1970s, hasn't got a bloody clue about any of this and trashes the work of the limits to growth. Mm. Totally ignorant, but successful. Now, somebody as ignorant as, as Nordhaus wouldn't have even been generated if we had a, a proper foundation where there was some compatibility between economics and physics. Yeah, so it, it sounds like a case of right ideas wrong time if if uh the physiocrats came along yeah. before the understanding oh, yeah. of thermodynamics if thermodynamics came first yeah then economic theory would have almost been like a jenga piece to to slide into thermodynamics and then we continue from yeah. there it would have been compatible whereas uh, 
Yeah, I mean, Phil Murawski, uh, who's done a huge amount of research into the evolution of neoclassical economics, he talked about the mathematics they based themselves on being what he called energetics prior to the understanding of thermodynamics properly. And said it really was based like a mechanical system. If you imagine putting a, you know, imagine that's a pencil, I put a pencil on top, then it's got to be in the point of equilibrium mm. for the balance to apply. And that sort of mathematics, uh, which was reversible, reversible mathematics turned up in their mm. thinking. The whole thing about thermodynamics, irreversible change. Mm. You, you can't unscramble an egg. Okay. Um, so the irreversibility of time would have been part of economic theory as well. And we could have very compatibly taken in the insights from physics rather than insulating ourselves from them. So let's say we had uh, thermodynamics come along or the understanding of thermodynamics a hundred years before the physiocrats came along. What about human nature? Mm -hmm. Do you think human nature would have eventually overtaken the free gift of nature and driven us to have a, an industrialization oh, we're, in the we're, same we're, vein or... or that's that's a huge danger that you know you have to think at a holistic level to be able to take into account what physics taught and what the physiocrats got right, and humans are pretty pretty good at not thinking at a holistic mm. level. So uh, there there would have been real clash, and we still stuff up. I mean, I think, we, but we would have had at least some forewarning of problems. Now, if you had a thermodynamically based economics back in the nineteen seventies when the limits to growth came out. Uh, that was think, yeah, well, that's quite compatible with our thinking about the economy. You're right. We've got to, we can't allow the pressures on the biosphere to get too great. Uh, we have to think at a collective level because individual behavior will, uh, you know, if you, if you do individual behavior in toto, we will always generate yeah. more waste than the biosphere can cope with. So you would have had to have a think in a, a collective level. It would not it never have been the adulation of a, of a, of a basically an anarchist system, which is what the neoclassicals promote. So um, there would have been a very, very different world, but of course it's not the one we're in, and now we're living with those consequences. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about the the effect that virality has on human nature and myself, because essentially industrialization was the the viral production of things that we were never able to produce before in history through new technologies, mm -hmm. and that there was this viral aspect of it, and it's so, it's so yeah. enticing to go viral to the to the human mind you know like even just putting up a piece of content and having millions of people view that and getting credit people recognizing you having you know being able to interact with more and more people if you have a, the a similar sort of virality aspect to industrialization i'm just wondering how good we would have been as a collective with the physiocratic understanding but also the thermodynamics understanding to avoid it, 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 the vir viral kind of like the hooks that viral virality sinks into the brain yeah i think that's that's quite true i mean we're a social species and, and that's what the dumbbell number comes that we can cope with 150 and that's, yeah. that's about it um we've got this enormous hierarchical system with billions involved in the hierarchies um, that will always be something, and we, we, we're not, you know, most humans aren't, don't consider the sort of topic you and I are talking about. Their, their main interest is what's going to happen in the World Cup. Uh, you know, um, so we, we are, we never, we never plan to be, you know, planet dominating species. Well, I'm an American, so I can, uh, uh, be... I can, uh, confidently state that I don't care about soccer. <laughs> Ameri Americans, Ameri <laughs> soccer, no, you, football, Americans, guys, uh, for whatever reason, it has not really caught on in America. I, I watch clips yeah. of the World Cup. Yeah, but none of this. And that's about it. Yeah, did you, you, you'll have your own, you've got your own of the baseball and, you know, American Yeah, we, we like, so. uh, you have a, you have a world championship in American yeah, football. Yeah, we, we you? much prefer sports where you Which get concussions and CTE. It's much, much more, uh, much yeah, more exciting yeah. to watch people bash their heads in together. I guess that's the, uh, the American yeah, indulgence. Yeah. Yeah, but that that you know the, the, those social issues are what we were into as a species. We're not into this systemic thinking. Oh. Um, you know, we don't have the brain power, and you know, thinking systemically requires additional mm. tools beyond which our brain itself provides. And um, that's what I built my Minsky software it, it, yeah. because of that. So yeah, we are, we're always we'd need to be far more intelligent than we are uh, to avoid the problems we've generated for ourselves on this biosphere. So speaking of holistic thinking and. and going back to the lack of societal holistic thinking back in 2008 you were one of the few economists to predict the financial crisis what were you mm. seeing that few others saw and how were you seeing this 
Well, the basic thing I saw was the role of credit in a capitalist economy. Credit is part of aggregate demand and income, and I hadn't properly worked out why that was the case when I wrote those. That was basic on the work from uh, from Hyman Minsky and, and people like that. And my own model of financial, the fi- I built my model of, um, of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis, and I saw that if you have far, far, if private debt is growing far too rapidly, uh, then and you have far too high a level of private debt, then you will get a point where credit debt stops growing, you get negative credit, and you'll have a financial downturn. That's exactly what happened, and that's what I that's what I um, modeled using my my software. At how the does time. credit? So how does credit become negative? You you say it builds up to a point, so I'm, and then eventually gets to a a, a negative tipping point. How how does that happen? Well, that, that's I explain that in the book fairly fairly completely. But the basic idea is you have if you look at the the the, the um, capitalism, you have workers, capitalists, and bankers. That's mm-hmm. my simplest model of capitalism. And uh, workers wage workers capacity to get wage demands depends upon the level of employment. Okay, and then you have uh, when you have a boom going on, uh, profits or income, uh, total GDP minus wages minus interest payments, and you have a boom going on the wages rise and the number of people employed rise. So what that means is you have less profitability coming in uh, because this Mm -hmm. non-linear increase in the wage bill occurs, moving a boom. You end up with less profit than you expected at the top, but you borrowed money to get there. So you borrow your debt commitments to remain. Uh, That will mean your, your, your profit gets to be less than you expect. You stop investing, you have a slump. And so that's that, that cyclical process of what I modeled back in 1992. Mm -hmm. Uh, and published in 1995. And that process is what I saw happening in the real economy. And because I was focusing on credit and I understood that credit was part of aggregate demand, that's what the mainstream wasn't even looking at. So like, I, I might even see if I can, I'm just looking in the background while we talk to see if I can find one of my, uh, one of my models on that front or one of the, the yeah. data output yeah. from the model. But I just saw negative credit coming and when negative credit happened, we'd have a crisis and that's precisely what happened. So there, there's... Uh, less profit, the borrowing increases, so people are still swiping their credit cards, and then we inevitably go into a slump, and that that's what happened yeah. in uh, yeah. two thousand eight. And, and and because with the rising level of private debt, at some point the slump uh, can't be reversed, mm-hmm. and you have a, a a runaway process because of extreme extreme levels of private debt. So that's that's the dynamics that I. Uh, that I could actually watch the financial crisis occurring. And neoclassicals to this day continue ignoring the role of credit and aggregate demand. So they can't see what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, it, it, it blew my mind when I, was, when I was going through that in the book because you talk about how the common buzzwords for financial crisis, people care a lot more about inflation or unemployment rate, but rarely do people talk about private, uh, mm. private debt, credit card debt. And to me, I'm thinking money to me is a credit card. I take out cash when I travel and I'm going outside the US. But other than yeah. that, you know, even when I travel now, I, I maybe take out a couple hundred bucks because most countries will take the credit card and they do the conversion rate. And I'm just, I'm swiping, I'm swiping, I'm swiping, pay off, pay off, pay off. So to me, yeah. having the, the main driver of people spending be credit card and, and accumulating credit card debt and essentially like you you can't even live without being in debt anymore unless you want to just pay all cash like you, you, and to be a functioning member of society yeah. you have to take on some sort of debt and to uh, ignore that private debt yeah. seems like so obvious like, like even my you know dumb economic yeah, brain is like yeah of course credit card debt and, and private debt is going to affect the economy and swing the economy that's at the mm. one thing that everyone does, everyone has a credit card. Not everyone has a house. Not mm. everyone takes out a mortgage. But like all people have credit cards. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in the case of the two thousand eight financial crisis, where did the the mortgages fit in? Is that private debt? Is is that something different? That's okay. private debt. So that. Now, look, I'll just actually quickly share my screen on that front because this is the data that if I can do a share screen here. Um, let me, see. Yeah, there should be a share button on the bottom. Do you see that? Okay. Yeah, when I'm trying to find the um, – oh, that'll, that'll do. I'll share the window. Okay. So that's that's the data that I was looking at. The red line is the level of private debt. The black line is government debt. 
neoclassicals obsess about the black line and ignore the red. When you look at the rate of change of private debt, you can see this plunge here from 15% of GDP in 2006 to minus 5% mm -hmm. in 2010. That's what caused the financial crisis. You'll notice there's no period of negative debt in the whole pre-war, uh, post-war period, except in 2007 to 2010. And because I could see that coming, that's why I warned about the crisis. Do I get taken notice of? Not in, the, not in a, a bloody skerrick. It's all the neoclassicals who that they award a prize and a Nobel Prize to somebody who didn't see the crisis coming. Yeah. And again, you you explain this all so. Uh, I, I it's uh, it's well written and <coughs> understandable for someone like me that has zero expertise in economics in the book. So for for a full for a full breakdown of what Steve is talking about, definitely go check out the book. And and I I just. I see the lines. I see the the red line with the the private debt going up, and the black line with government debt relatively towards the bottom. I'm trying to remember if, mm -hmm. from the book what, what exactly does government debt represent? Like what what are the factors? That goes government debt is fun. Go government debt is fundamentally government created money. Government created money. So okay. that cool. that is yeah because uh, <coughs> that's loans, lo loaning out money. No. No, it's not loans. We we have a, we have a, a two parts. So we have a mixed fiat credit economy. The, the credit system creates money by creating mm -hmm. debt. The fiat system creates uh, money by creating negative equity for the government sector, which becomes a identical positive equity for the private sector. And that's how a fiat system works. And um, so what we've done is we misunderstand the fiat system. So all the crap that Bernanke writes about money is crap uh, about where it comes from and. And the, the argument the government borrows money. No, it doesn't. It creates money and then issues bonds equivalent to the money it's created. And the bonds are effectively the record of money creation. Um, so that, uh, so the fiat system, uh, is, it, if you have fiat money being created, the people who get fiat money don't owe a debt because of the fiat mm. money. So if you get a welfare check, you don't owe it back to the government. If the government buys goods off you, you don't owe it back to the government. So fiat money is created without a debt for the recipient. But credit, private money is necessarily created with a debt for the recipient of that money. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, that money can get transferred to somebody else. So you swipe your credit card, you're going shopping overseas somewhere, you know, you get an extra croissant, the, 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 your, your debt level goes up by the price of the mm -hmm. croissant, and the money for the croissant turns up in the, in the, uh, in the uh, shop, shopkeeper's account. So we uh, always private debt, private money involves private debt creation, Government money involves uh, the, the capacity of the government to maintain negative equity. Mm. And this is, this is equity in terms of financial claims. So what ends up the government, by running a deficit, generates financial claims on itself, which it's quite capable of meeting because it can create the currency. And that makes the big difference between private debt and public debt. So the, the, the government debt comes from the negative equity. And then when they're in negative equity, they issue the bonds that people buy. And so th that is how the government yeah, the, creates the, money. The, the negative e negative equity has no effect. The, the bonds have no effect on the government's negative equity. The bonds actually, all the bonds do is mean the government doesn't run a, a, a overdraft at the central bank. Mm -hmm. That's what the role of the bonds is. But the act, um, but the actual money creation comes out of the fact that uh, the government is capable because people accept the government's money for all transactions in that particular economy then the government can run up a deficit in its own net worth, which becomes an identical surplus in the hands of the private sector. So government money creation, um, they can get out of hand, it can go crazy. We've all talked about that. There's Zimbabwe, there's you know, the Weimar Republic, et cetera, et cetera, elements of fiat money creation. But when you look at the major economy, the America, the UK, Europe, and so on, um, we haven't had an event like that in the large economies, except when there's been a war like the Second World, like the First World War, with the destruction of Germany. Mm. Um, and uh, so the fiat system is capable of generating a monetary system without the private credit system. But we have the two together. And what economic theory has ended up doing is, is misunderstanding both of them. For like conventional economic theory, if you've done an economics degree, you don't learn much at all about the monetary system because according to your model, banks are just intermediaries and you, and you, and you the government borrows from the public. Neither of those things are true. Mm. 
but that's the foundation of what people learn in an economics degree. So the the government does not borrow money from the public. The government takes on a negative equity, and then the, and Creates then they money. create money by yeah. issuing the the bonds. No, the the bonds are ancillary. The the deficit's created the money. The deficit yeah. itself creates okay, money. Print, printing money essentially. But I've got to look at I've got to look at time. By the way, I've got I've got a half an hour before I'm supposed to be giving a talk here, so we have to wrap up in the next twenty minutes. Okay, or so. got it. Uh, but okay, but the, the basic thing is the government. Uh, if you think about what money f- fundamentally is in a modern economy, it's predominantly money in private bank accounts. Mm. Okay. So if you want to create money, you've got to increase the liability of the banking sector. To increase the liability of the banking sector, you have to also increase the assets at the same time. So banks do it by creating a loan and putting money in the deposit accounts so the assets go up, the liabilities up. The government uh, puts money in people's private bank accounts, running a deficit, they also put the same amount of the same number in the reserve accounts of the private banks. Mm. That's the money creation activity. Then the bond sales swaps. It says to the banks, the primary dealers and so on in the American system, you've got we've created like a trillion dollars worth of reserves for you, which are paying say three mm-hmm. percent interest. Uh, we're going to sell bonds to you if you like, selling three point two five. Would you like to take advantage of that offer? Of course they do. Mm. So they go from three percent to three point two five. And it's rock solid, guaranteed by the government. So that is just changing what the, the backing goes from being reserves to, to bonds. It doesn't actually create the money mm. itself. So I wanted to linger on the the money doesn't matter point again. Uh, you mentioned that neoclassical economists will teach you that money doesn't matter. And you mentioned in the book it, that it happens pretty early on in an economics degree. Yeah. And... I actually, I, I spent four years studying accounting and d- did All not right. learn, uh, l- like the, the question of what is actual, what is money actually, and not just uh, mm-hmm. the credit and debit side of things where you're doing all these sort of transactions, like from a fundamental standpoint, what is money? Your answer in the book that money is the promise of a third party, that was the first time I'd ever heard someone explain it like that. And I've gone to school for, you know, four plus years and then and grad school for one more year while I was playing baseball. And I, I, I just wanted I just wanted to yeah. to linger on that point for a second, like the, this concept that money doesn't matter and your definition of money being the promise of a third party. Like how how mm. how can uh, these rationales exist without acknowledging the thing that everyone does like, like w- without acknowledging the the promise of the the third party people uh, or and if you could even explain uh, in more depth what that promise of a third party means just so people uh who understand listening to this who have not heard that phrase before well the basic um thing is that if you what 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 money is in in a bank it's um the, the, you, you, if, you, if you deposit money, if you take, take cash and put cash into the bank, the cash actually goes into the vaults of the, um, of the, of the bank and you then get a deposit account and the deposit account says, if you want to take this money down, we will give you the cash back. Um, so, uh, and then people accept that banks are legitimate um, um, recorders of monetary worth so if you transfer money from your bank account to my bank account, I'll send you whatever you, you know, I'll send you a copy of uh, debunking economics in, re- in response. So we're transferring the, the promise to pay, which is the amount of money in your bank account. You've transferred a part of it to my bank account. I therefore give you the book. Um, that is this essence of how exchange occurs in a capitalist economy. Now, neoclassicals say that's just making it it's a veil over barter. So you and I have bartered for the book. Fundamentally, you can ignore the monetary system. That would be feasible to be true if the um, uh, the money itself made no difference to total demand. But what I show in the book as well is that credit is part of aggregate demand. Mm. Okay, And because it's part of aggregate demand, because it can go positive, massively positive and also massively negative, it's the most volatile part of demand. It's what will drive the economy. So that's why it matters so much to understand the monetary system. If credit didn't actually affect aggregate demand, if government spending didn't affect aggregate demand, you wouldn't mm. need to understand either. You still understand capitalism. But if you don't understand both of those, you have an elaborate model that looks like it fits the data and is completely mm. wrong, just like 
Ptolemaic astronomers were wrong about the structure of the universe. So by that definition, is Bitcoin money? No, Bitcoin is not money. Okay. Bitcoin can be used for transactions. Um, so then, and that's what makes people think it's, it's money. Some people trust it, others don't. But the basic definition of money is the promise of a third party that the other party is willing to accept as a complete extinguishment of the debts between two individuals. Mm. Okay. So a credit note is not money in that sense. A bank deposit is money because we'll all accept it. Now, of course, a Bitcoin, nobody accepts it. And what Bitcoin does as well is it accentuates the store of value side of money. But the more you push up the store of value, the less you're going to use it for transactions. And what we can see, most people, you know, that's where HODL came from, hold on for dear life, yeah. because you think it's always going to increase in value. You don't want to get the go of it, so you're not going to use it for transactions. And that defeats the whole purpose of a monetary, a monetary entity. You want it to be used for transactions. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how how Bitcoin and cryptocurrency fits into your new economics theory. Like, is this is this something that could be it's long term and, and become an alternative source of money in the future? Will, will this never be something that people primarily use and will always be on the traditional system of, of credit and borrowing? Look, I, I think given, given, the, given the fact that one of the fundamental parts of Bitcoin is wasting large amounts of energy, okay, to determine its scarcity, and given where we're going into it, it's going to get banned at some point. Okay, because the easiest way to reduce energy consumption on the planet right now is to ban Bitcoin. Really, the the, okay, you get rid of the easiest way right now. Yeah, the, yeah. The, and if you think about what's what's using large amounts of energy and producing bugger all, the answer is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not very uh, so it's not very to, physiocratic. No, not at all, not at all. Okay, so given the, the circumstances we're in now, I expect at some point uh, governments. So if you have a huge energy crisis, like we're Europe's about to experience and now we're going to a pretty severe winter. You're copying the same uh, with a polar vortex effect in America right now. If you start getting energy shortages coming out, of, and they're critical, mm -hmm. so means you know, people have got the choice of you know, freezing to death or shutting down Bitcoin. I know which one's going to go first. Mm. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to end off on talking about energy in that same vein, and you actually uh, in your book. You quote Tim Lenton, um, a, cl a climate change yep. scientist, and uh, Tim Lenton says that there's currently a huge gulf between natural scientists' understanding of climate tipping points and economists. Economists, <laughs> I can't talk. Uh, economists' uh, representations of climate catastrophes in assessment models. So, what what's driving yeah. this gulf between scientific understanding and economic standing and uh, understanding, rather? And how do we close this gap? Well, the, the economists just want want to continue believing capitalism can cope with anything. That's that's their basic logic. You know, can cope with anything before climate change can't be a problem. That's really about the only way you can summarize the nonsense that Nordhaus has published and got, you know, the bloody Nobel Prize for. So this huge um, gap is because physicists actually, you know, if you if you want to have an ideology, be in, make it an ideology that exalts life. Mm. Okay. And if fundamentally in that sense, physicists and climate change scientists have it and they can see us destroying the capacity of the biosphere to support life. And they're saying, stop or we'll die. Um, that's very, very different to the neoclassical. We think, oh, let's assume we can live without any, without, uh, uh, without inputs from the real world. Then we can go on forever. And of course, you start with a production theory that has labor and capital, but no energy going in as a production theory. Then you don't even see your dependence upon the physical real world. And this is what neoclassicals are blind to. Mm. Yeah. Um, there's, uh, I'm, I'm blanking out on, what the name of the paper is, but there's a a, a a section of the book where you talk about the I IPCC. I just want to see if I can. Um, yeah. And you me you mentioned two assumptions in one of the uh, climate. Uh, I, I I don't know if the right word is a climate accord of the IPCC, but the the assumptions of how the world will change over time from an economic standpoint and climate change. And, and there are leading economists that say that temperature increase in the future, global increase of temperature will essentially have uh, little to no effect on income distribution and levels of income in general. 
Uh, and, there, and there's another assumption. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking out right now, but it, it, it just struck me again in that same vein as being so obvious of how how could you uh, justify your theory or, or modeling by making an assumption like increase in global temperature will not have an effect on income distribution when, you know, as you point out, many places will become uninhabitable. There will be large periods of the year where people won't be able to work or maybe even go outside. There'll, there'll be warnings and all sort of things mm -hmm. like that. It just seems like there's such a big uh, divide and ignorance from what you talk about in the economics world, the, the mainstream economics world of acknowledging mm -hmm. the effect, the, the uh, effect of climate change on something like income. Well, I mean, what they seem is that uh, for a start, they seem a roof will protect you from climate change. That was the other assumption. And, yeah, uh, that's that. Kind of, yeah, that. You know, and also, they can use the current data on GDP and temperature to predict what's going to happen with climate change. Both absolute nonsense assumptions. Any physicist who'd actually even asked a referee paper like would have thrown them out, saying this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And instead, what they gave the gig on they gave that guy a Nobel Prize, William Nordhaus. So there's a physical ignorance built into their assumptions. And the reason it got passed is because the referees for those papers are also economists who also don't understand the physical climate system. So what you've got is a whole range of empirical assumptions. This is what I find crazy, and I find it amazing that I'm the first person to really identify this as well. There have been plenty of critics of mainstream neoclassical economics of climate change, but they haven't taken a look at the how they generated their empirical data. Now, they're generated by making up numbers that have got nothing to do with climate change and then fitting functions to it. So this is, the, this is the crazy thing. I haven't even discussed the basis of their modeling, of what's called a Ramsey growth model. Haven't even bothered because the, the physical assumptions they make are so important and so totally wrong that that alone is enough to say, throw these guys out. We shouldn't even be listening to them. Now, instead, they've become how most people outside climate science think climate change is going to happen. And that's why we're being very blasé, I think, rolling into a set of crises we're going to see in the next one or two decades, which will be existential for capitalism. And the last people who realize it's actually happening will be neoclassical economists. So do you think that an alternative school of thought will be able to influence the economical decisions enough from the outside before we reach a tipping point? No, absolutely not. I guarantee that won't happen. Well, I'm, I'm one of the people trying to do it. Okay? And I know I'm going to have no effect. I won't be listened to until after the crisis, and even then I might be lucky. It'll be luck that means I get listened to rather than otherwise. So we're going to run right into this crisis. Uh, it's going to be a total shock. It'll be breakdown of food systems, you know, global famine, um, you know, cr critical, maybe the, 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 the wet bulb catastrophe may be the first, but I've got a feeling maybe it'll be drought uh, uh, droughts and then damaging food baskets and a global shortage of food as a result. Something of that nature will come along. And they'll still go back and ask the economists what to do, just like they did after the financial crisis. So rather than ask people like me who saw the crisis coming, they went back to Bernanke, okay, who didn't see it coming. So I just have no, no, no hope whatsoever of being listened to before the crisis, but I'm trying to build something for work after the crisis happens. Yeah, you, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that it becomes the responsibility of people outside of economic, the, the traditional economics degrees in universities it becomes prof the responsibility of professors outside of that world to teach alternative views of economics outside of neoclassical and this is a great representation of why that seems to be so because you have scientists that are largely coming to the similar conclusion that if we keep living the way that we're living with human input and human influence that we're going to destroy the planet and economics is largely tied into that, that you, you can't get away from the, the economics versus the climate change. They, they, they're intertwined with each other. And so it would be in scientists best interest to have an alternative theory of economics to support their work as well. And that seems like it would kind of feed off each other, but I mean, it's a very dark place to be uh, to think that, your job, what what you're doing is utterly hopeless. Like, is that how you feel on a day to day basis? That you're doing you're you're yeah, doing something is. that has, you know, little to no chance of panning out. Well, I mean, 
there's, I, I'm just hoping there'll be human civilization surviving after the climate crisis we go through. But the best chance it has to survive it is to chuck neoclassical economics in the garbage of internet history. So, and, uh, and to see why the economists led us astray, that's absolutely vital. So I'm trying to get that built up. But the same way I did work before the financial crisis, pointing out that a crisis was coming. I knew I wouldn't be listened to after the crisis if I didn't make a noise beforehand. So a similar thing this time round. And like I, I have got some exposure, I will have some impact upon how people think about climate change once it becomes obvious that it's absolutely critical, if not a trivial issue, it's an existential one. Uh, then at that point, maybe there'll be a chance to build a rival economics. But the main thing at the moment is how the hell do we finance uh, our attempt to reverse the damage we've done? And that's the main thing that I would practically hope I can contribute to after uh, the the ecological breakdown becomes obvious. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, you know, if you're if you're trying to bring to fruition a massive undertaking like slide out one theory of economics and then replace it with an alternative theory that will allow us to continue as a civilization, you need to press some pretty fucking big levers in order to make that happen. Levers of influence, you know, even outside yeah. the economic community. Like, it sounds stupid, but people like, you know, Kim Kardashian, uh, you know, Tom Brady, like influential levers of people that have an audience, even if it's not in economics or climate change specifically, is there are there any sort of levers that you see if you just cast aside like the ridiculousness of reaching out to people that high up like if you could if, if you had unlimited resources for your position in order to spread the knowledge of the new economics are there levers that you could press today that weren't pressed back in 2008 to warn people or maybe weren't available in 2008? Like if you if you just throw aside all the silly thinking, like anything that you could do to spread the the adoption of a better way. I think, as you mentioned, getting some celebrities to realize what's going on would help immensely, okay? because we are a celebrity driven species. So, yeah, that would help. Uh, but we, we wouldn't avoid the crash, but once it happened, people might be aware of where the hell it came from. So I want to get this into popular culture, and that's one reason I went on Lex Friedman's podcast, for example, uh, to try to get that awareness out more broadly. So yeah, we if, if influencers, if it's now social media people, of actors realize just how bad this stuff is and can say it, then they'll get listened to in a way that I won't. Yeah, I, I don't have nearly the size of, of Lex Friedman's audience, but I'll do my best to tap into the viral nature that may have gotten us into this situation in the first place through through reels and uh, YouTube clips and things like that because, um, you know, it, it's it's far outside my understanding the, the work that you do and hearing you talk on podcasts and... and reading your work definitely helps me have a, a better grasp on it. But I, I think it's it, it can be fascinating to just like plunge into a theory that, you know, maybe you haven't learned about in 10 years or, or just like economics in general, something that you can tap into that you learned in school or, or you thought you were done with. And then you pick up a book and you're like, holy shit, like all these things that no one ever told me, this is fascinating. This is how yeah. money works. This is what money is. This is how our economy is functioning. There are these, you know, there are these sides like the the the, the Austrian economics, the neoclassical, the, the physiocrats, like, like all this history mm -hmm. that, um, you know, it's it, almost like rivalries in uh, professional sports. Yeah. It, it, I just want to encourage people to try to come to their own understanding and and i'm not always the the greatest at that you know sometimes i can read a headline and go you know this you know th this is what it has to be because it it was published in the new york times or something but i i just want to mm. tell people as we end off to to definitely check this out and check out your work check out lex friedman's podcast it, it truly is fascinating and, and i hope that i've uh set the stage for this conversation to also encourage people to want to learn as well Thank you. Okay. Um, do, do you have time for one more question, just like a general life meaning question as we end off? Pretty, pretty, pretty fast. So that's, it's 10 minutes for us to start here. So you maybe finish in sure. three minutes. Uh, so 
you know, neoclassical economics, uh, we've said it's like a church that ignores its own untruths. Um, you know, is there an untruth in your life, even outside of economics, that you suspect you may be ignoring? Like, like something that you, like your version of faith, essentially. Oh, I suppose it's a naivety about humanity being able to learn. <laughs> And like if any, anything, my face has declined in that over time. So um, I think in some ways I thought if I warn about a crisis before it happens and the crisis happens, I'll listen to afterwards. I've given up mm. on that, unfortunately, because I did that with the financial crisis. And yes, I had a bit of influence. I've got a, a certain exposure in, in uh, you know, uh, it, it as a non-orthodox person, but the orthodoxy rolls on regardless. It's a juggernaut. You can't stop it. So... Um, if anything, the only naive thing I'm doing is believing that I can stop the juggernaut. Yeah, I mean... What I said I'm doing is, well, once it crashes, I'll be saying, that's why the bloody thing crashed. Let's now try to survive out of the mess it's created yeah. out of our society. I, I may have an optimism fueled by idiocy and, and ignorance, but I am I hope that we can find a way out of this. Uh, la last thing, as an Australian, what do you find most beautiful and unique about Australian culture? The, the mateship element, the fact we have to support each other in a hostile environment, so there was a the t tend to be people to take care of each other, which has been diminished by the whole housing bubble over there, unfortunately, and the whole materialist orientation of neoliberalism, which originated in Australia. So that that long uh, period of you know people supporting each other, that's what I like most about that particular culture. And again, living in a in a in a, uh, a, a continent in which the life forms are totally. In marsupials rather than mammals, monotremes as well. Uh, it gives you a uniqueness or a, a sense that things can be done differently and still succeed. So that's uh, that's well, positive. Steve. Thank you so much for joining me. Is there a place where people should follow you? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there's two places. Yeah, on my Patreon page, so wwwpatreoncom slash Keen and there's also profstevekeen.substack.com, and I can. And you can be a, a member for free on Substack. They're both obviously where they get my income and it supports the work that I'm doing. So I definitely want to have people providing uh, funding for my research. Uh, but uh, all the posts there are free access. So you can go and check them if, if you don't financially support me. So uh, pa Patreon slash Prof. Steve Keen and Prof. Steve Keen dot substack dot com those are the two yes and, and wherever you're watching this or listening to this this will all be linked into the episode so please go check it out before you end off and uh again steve